Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, public webinar, Saturday morning market discussion, something a little bit different. We don't usually do weekend webinars, but thank you to those of you who decided to join us on this Saturday. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. So the first thing that's in my mind I'm gonna talk about has absolutely nothing to do with the market, but it does have to do with triumph. I am just in the process of finishing a book. The name of the book is um, Osama Masters. And it's a memoir. She was uh, in an orphanage, orphanage in Ukraine, no thumbs, uh, no real bones in her legs. One leg had to be amputated. The other leg is, is you know, deformed. She, at five years old, she still hasn't been adopted. She finally gets an adopted by an American woman. She goes on to win the paraplegic, Olympian, Olympian paraplegic. It is, it starts off one of the most heartbreaking things you've ever read, but it's one of the most encouraging things of what people can, can do. Um, they said one story in there early on, she has no thumbs. She sees the, the boy next door after she gets adopted and comes to the U.S., sees him hand walk across a, uh, a swing set. He goes, shinnies up the pole and, you know, hand over hand from the top bar. And she wants to do that. And she has the mother lift her up there for a couple hours. She's falling because she has no thumbs to hold on. And her mother tells her, you know, there's just some things you, you can't do, Osana. And um, there's a babysitter involved. And a couple of weeks later, she calls her mom, go outside, go outside. She shinnies up the pole and she hand walks across the top of the thing. It is just her mother never again told her there's something you can't do, Os Osana. It is just an absolute. Oksana. Uh, just for people who are interested in, in the title of that book, it's Oksana, O-K-S-A-N-A, -A, Masters. And it's called The Hard Parts. It is just, if you really want to talk about what you can, what you can do, if you put your mind to it. And I, I find that interesting because the success rate in trading is so small. Um, and most people just, they don't know, they don't know what it takes to really be successful at something. So many times it, it's, I keep thinking about how many times you see People pontificate about sports and all oh, this team and that team. They know all the statistics, but they couldn't play. They couldn't engage in the game itself, but yet they think they're experts on it. Um, the other thing, before I get to a couple slides and then we'll, we'll go on to markets, but another book that I find fascinating, the name of it is called Chatter, C-H-A-T-T-E-R. The Voice in Your Head, Why It Matters and How to Harness It by Ethan, uh, I guess it's Cross, K-R-O-S-S. -S. Recommendations are by several of the people that I read and like. Angela Duckworth, best-selling author of Grit. Um, Carol DeWick, best-selling author of, author of Mindset. Um, Daniel Pink, um, really, and it's, and it's amazing because it's, and you really start thinking about this voice in our head that tells us we can do something. Oh, I'm not good at that, or I'm good at this. The voice in that head can be very, very destructive. Anyhow, I just start this out, and I'm, I'm thinking back. Um, many of, of you uh, have heard of or have read Brett Steenbarger. Years ago, when I first wrote Mind Over Markets, Brett sent me back a... Uh, 40 to 60 page response on the book. And one of the things that he commented on was how many recommendations there were on books that had absolutely nothing on the surface, had nothing to do with trading. Um, and the reason that is that, and you'll see as soon as we get into the slides here, in fact, let's go to the first slide and we'll tie this together a little bit. Okay. We start off with, we can't talk about the market without including you or us or me in the equation. Let's go to the next slide. Success is a combination 
of market understanding standing blended with self understanding and that's the reason that these 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 books are so interesting to me uh and the you the paraplegic from ukraine what it takes to get inside is just and be successful and overcome all the odds the the book on chatter um the talk that we do that goes on in our heads that can be either constructive or destructive to what we do i talk to a lot of you from time to time and i'm amazed to hear people say well i can't do that um well that's that's not in my dna and i just kind of kind of shudder because there's so many things we can do if we want to do them bad enough we have a client and it's an individual that was a very prominent successful oil and gas um, and environmental attorney i mean very successful ranked um, in the very top level he was he was taught by he said the best oil and gas attorney in the country he said he was kind of mean he tells the story he said you know he'd ask a question he said do we actually pay you for ex asking dumb questions like that i mean take no quarter whatsoever he took an intensive and i think it was probably the well he quit he quit being a lawyer he wanted to spend more time with his family 41 years old has a two-year and four-year-old girl wanted to spend more time with his family and you know being a big a big name attorney in, in deal making in the oil and gas area and environmental law um it didn't allow him much time to be with with the family so he thought he would become a trader and uh, so he could be at home in more time with his family, et cetera. One of the reasons, and I asked him one day, I said, why did you, why did you come to us? He said, I came to you because he said, everybody else promises quick returns. He said, you're the only person that said, if you really work hard and, and the goal would be to break even at the end of two years. And he said, I knew, I knew that was for real because he said when he became an oil and gas attorney, he said it took him a full year just to be able to read one of the offering circulars. You know, there's, there's so much of those circulars, the, the detail is in the footnotes and, and things of that nature. And where I'm going with this, here's a, here's a guy, he didn't have, he didn't have a lot of ex training you know, from trading, no, no bad baggage, not a lot of junk to unlearn, which most of us, most of us have to deal with. About the, after the second in, intensive, Jen thought we ought to meet. So Jen had the wherewithal to, you know, put us on a phone call together. And he's now, I think he just completed his third intensive. He is, to my knowledge, the best client we've ever had from a success ratio now it may not be actual dollars because i don't know the size some people trade but i see his trades every night it's just something i was interested in tremendous risk control um and just be able to read and understand the markets but doesn't let himself get in the spirals doesn't let himself get caught so it is doable it is doable and I, I deal and talk to a lot of you, and I know how difficult this can be. But the thing that, that it is, success is a combination of market understanding blended with self-understanding. So I'm gonna stop at this point. I'm gonna do a small commercial. And the reason we do these programs is to keep you informed and to promote some of our educational programs. The current educational program that we're promoting is what we call the Primer. And the, the Primer is an, I think it's an eight day course. Jen will give you the details. Um, but it's really designed to introduce you to market generated information, 
how we employ the market profile. Understand, we are not market profile traders. We simply use the market profile to organize the market's continuous two-way auction process. But it introduces you to how we look at the markets, how the instruction goes for you to be able to make some of the decisions if you want to pursue what we're doing. And remember, we don't promise quick fixes. I continue to say, if you really started from scratch and did well, the goal would be to break even at the end of two years. Jen, do the little commercial and then we'll go back to what we came here for today. Okay, well, I just want to explain for some folks uh, who may be either new to us or maybe they're familiar, but uh, the Primer is a live course that we don't offer very often. It's only offered a few times a year. And, you know, if we didn't have a lot, if you've been on the fence, you know, and you want to take a course, maybe you're not ready to commit to spending the money for the foundation and application of the market profile e-course. I'd say start off with the Primer then, because you'll know for sure um, if you like our teaching, uh, you like the way that we look at the markets uh, for a really inexpensive price. And, and then you can go on and take the foundation and application of the market profile e-course um, you know, if you're convinced that market profile and how we teach is for you. Uh, but, you know, if we didn't have a primer available, I usually direct people to start off with the foundation foundation e-course, otherwise wait for another primer. And uh, so if for those of you who are wondering, what's the right tractor, what's the right order of courses to do? It would be the primer if it's available, then the foundation and application of the market profile e-course, and intensive, and if you want to continue your learning, you know, do the advanced nuances and exceptions e-course. That's just to give new people an idea of what's the correct order of things. Uh, here's the other thing that I will say. People that start off with the foundation e-course because we don't have a primer available, usually come back and take a primer when it's available. Why? Because it's another iteration of those uh, foundational basics. You get to hear Jim um, you know, teach the linear portion of the foundation e-course for the first four days. And then the latter four days, uh, he narrates the markets and puts the variables together depending on whatever the live market gives us. So uh, just to give you a good idea of what that is. In the latter four days, we also provide live commentary when we are not in a live webinar, as well as daily reports, which is our form of homework. So Let me explain what live commentary is. Um, I can input on my computer screen, it appears on your computer screen, pertinent things that you should be or may want to be looking at at the market at, the, at, at that moment in time. Okay? Go ahead, Jen. Yes, and so uh, if you have any questions about which program is right for you or you have, you know, you've got some clarification questions that you have, by all means, uh, please contact us at Dalton at JimDaltonTrading.com at the bottom of our screen here or at the phone number here. I will be happy to speak with you and answer any questions that you may have. But uh, the primer isn't just for people who are new to market profile. It's for people who are, want a really good review. We have a lot of clients that have been with us a long time and they take a primer just as a good reviewer to hear newbies questions or because they're just interested in the latter four days where Jim is providing live commentary, daily reports and narration on the market. The other thing to mention too uh, that separates the primer from the foundation e-course is that uh, even though, you know, the concept of value, we try to emphasize it a lot in the primer. It's emphasized in the foundation e-course, but we do the exercise of how to plot the profile manually. Even though we give the directions to you for that in the foundation e-course, we do it as an actual exercise on the fourth day, which would be the Saturday. Um, you can click here on uh, uh, the primer information and see the schedule right here. You can download this, print it out. But basically, we do that as an exercise uh, on Saturday so that you know how to do it manually. If you don't have the software yet or if you're on the fence about spending money on the software, there is another way you can do it very inexpensively without any cost. You can do it manually. Um, I did it manually for eight markets for the first uh, couple of years when I got in, introduced. Jen, talk exactly. about the price before we go back to the... Uh, yes, program. right now it's on sale through this Sunday for $399. Great price. Regularly, it's, you know, $499 is, a, is the full price. So $399, you get it on sale. Save, save yourself $100. Uh, purchasing earlier always yields you a better price. 
So uh, till this Sunday at 11.59 midnight Eastern time, you can purchase it for $399, okay? Thank you. Okay, you wanna go back to slides now, right? Thank you, yes. Okay, here you go. All right, and let's look at the, uh, the next slide. The first paragraph in the preface of my book, Mind Over Markets, excellent in any excellence in any endeavor, be it carpentry, medicine, athletics, or futures trading, is only achieved through a careful balance between the analytical and intuitive powers of your mind. A lot of times people look and they understand the surface. They understand what is a poor low, what is a weak low? What's the significance of it? And that's one thing to know the pieces. That's like knowing the statistics, you know, in an athletic contest or, or music or something of that nature. To put it all together and bring your tremendous intuitive powers to work, to make it a whole, takes a lot of practice and a lot, and a lot of dedication and desire. All right, let's go to the next slide. If you are serious about becoming a successful trader, start with self-reflection. I'm gonna introduce some questions here, and they're, they're questions you should be asking yourself because they are very relevant. Let's look at that list of questions. Do you execute go with trades? Go with trades are all of a sudden, the market starts to move in a direction. Can you go with that move? <clears throat> so many of the people that we deal with that are not successful or struggle with the markets are those that are trading, they fade trade, meaning go against, or reversion to the mean. In other words, go with trade, the market opens at five, at, 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 the, at five, for example, and it's got good confidence, goes five, six, seven, eight, and they can get on that trade and go with it. Very few people can do that. The majority of people that we find that struggle, they can, if, a, if a, something goes from five to 10, they can sell it at 10 because their mind tells them it can go back to five. That there's sometimes that works, and we don't want to eliminate that. But you need to be able to do both and understand, but ask yourself, as you do the self-reflection, ask yourself, what kind of trading do you do? What gives you the best success? Do you need a confirmation to enter a trade? <coughs> I get people all the time that tell me, well, I'm looking for a confirmation. Well, say you got a trend day. By the time you get a confirmation in a trend day, it's pretty late. Do you let the profits run? Or, you know, are you so excited to have a profit, you get out early and you, you, you hang around with the losses, but you get out of your profits too early. It happens all the time. Does FOMO or fear of missing out overpower you? Tremendous number of traders. Really, they get it in their head. Remember, talk about the little voice in your head, the book I was talking about, Chatter. You know, that little voice says, boy, I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this. Fear of missing out is probably one of the most serious hindrances to successful trading there is. People just, oh my, the, the fear of missing out overwhelms them. Anyhow, what I'm really saying here, take an inventory, understand what you do, understand what you work, what, what works for you, what doesn't work, where, what do you need to concentrate on? It's being honest, self-reflection, being honest with yourself. Okay, let's look at, we've just got another slide or two here. Is there one more? Oh, so now let's just stop right here. We'll talk about the current environment. So Jen, let's go back and look at my market screen, if you would. Okay, I'll give you the screen. There you go. Okay. So what's been going on? for months, I have seen no indication of longer term money in the market. I mean, that doesn't mean zero, but I'm talking about, you know, really dominating the market. 
that doesn't mean that you know some longer term managers don't come out of one group and into another group but i'm talking about new commitment of net new commitment of money to the market i haven't seen it one of our clients runs one of the largest trading desks uh, for one of the major major firms institutional trading desk and he said he's come on a couple times and he said jim you're absolutely right our order book there, there are no orders on the book he said the long, you're right the long-term money is not active in the market so in in places what's happened the market has gotten heavier and heavier and heavier with, with short-term trading traders and now everybody's the big thing is now everybody's talking about zero dated options and you know it's just bringing absolutely huge volume into the market but the market's not going any place a lot of churn a lot of churn going on but and and what you have to do is you have to be able to adjust to the market to the environment that you are in so many times traders want to say well, this is the way i'm going to trade this is how i trade my statement to people is if you want to be a professional full-time trader you have to adapt to the market. The market is not going to adapt to you. I mean, this has been going on for months that the market has been totally different than any market I've ever seen. I've been trading for 50 years. But it's actually been a pretty good market. It's been a pretty good market um, to trade as long as you can keep an open mind. Now, I'm just going to show you before we go on, I'm going to show you one piece of information is what we call market generated information on the right screen is the es on the left screen is the spy notice the similarities the white line right here is half back the white line right here is half back notice the similarities now, when I see the market sell off in these two back-to-back -back periods at exactly half back, that's just one piece of market information that is very meaningful to me. That tells me that that is short-term trading money. The market was down in the morning. It was down in the morning, and there's a, gets a tone for the day, and traders are selling all all rallies the day before they were buying uh, i'm buying all rallies next day they're selling all rallies when it comes from these exacting levels that is market generated information that communicates to me that this is short-term traders i used to run an institutional trading desk when i was with ubs years ago institutions don't sell at exact levels institutions go to great extremes to hide from you what they're doing if the institutions want you to know what they're doing you don't want to know they're trying to take advantage of you when you see the market coming from these exact levels you know who you're competing against now when i see this information and the market's going down yes yeah, short-term traders are selling every break or every I'm sorry they're selling every rally but I know that the chances of that continuing is terrible because the characteristics of the short-term traders they a lot of them don't take trades home overnight either because they're not well enough capitalized uh, or they just don't want to but most of their clearing firms you know won't let them so is this market you know if they're selling off from here that may be a fair trade that it would can't what we call an anchor trade that is a trade but understand what you're doing the the, the odds of this having continuation are poor now you say well what are you talking about jim it went down here for you know these two periods it went really low but look what happened late in the day look what happened on the spot so if you know who you're competing against you know their characteristics you know that they don't have the staying power yes you can take advantage of, of what they're doing but understand don't look for the home run you know it's, the chances of it having continuation are very poor 
the day before the market going up, the market generated information on the rally, the upside was one of the worst I've ever seen. And look what happened the following day, the market came all the way back. So now we can't put all that together in a couple of minutes here, but that is the kind of way you have to see the market. You have to realistically understand what's going on in the market in order to have a fair chance to be a competitive full-time trader. Okay, so now we came on here and advertised this to talk about the coming week. So what do we have? What's the big event next week? Well, first of all, before we do that, let's go look at a let's go look at a bar chart. So we look at the bar chart, and here's the ES. We're in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's that? One, two, three, four, seven days. The market's basically gone nowhere. We closed near the lows yesterday. So when the market, this isn't exactly balanced. Here's a here's balance here. When the market is balanced, what it's telling you is the market wants more information before it makes its next directional move. This doesn't look as nice as this balance, but in a way, this is this is balanced. And we closed weak, so you're, you know, you're right in about the middle of these seven day, the seven day range. And now we've got what's coming up next week. Well, to start off with, all I was really going to talk about was, you know, the big thing next week is going to be the FOMC, uh, and that's you know release on on uh, it comes out on Wednesday. So the market right now, with the turmoil going on in the uh, in in banking, and generally speaking, you know when you have SBC with the first crack, that is very very seldom the end of it. And now we've had two more. Are there more? Who knows? But it well could be. So it, it would be very unusual that all of a sudden, you know, it's over. It starts and it's over in a week or so. You know, it started a week ago Thursday. It would be very unlikely that the turmoil was over that quickly. You got the U.S., you've got Europe, you got, of course, then you had Swiss Bank Corp in Europe. Um, usually these things these things go on for some period of time. And let me just give you a very simple example of where the problem comes from. Let's say a bank says, oh, okay, we're gonna, we're, look at us, we're very secure. We have government, we have government bonds. Well, guess what? As interest rates go higher, remember on a bond, there's an inverse relationship. So as yields go higher, the price of the bond goes down. Just the fact that it's a government bond yeah, you may get your full value at, uh, you know, at expiration or, you know, at the end of the, the period. But guess what? In the meantime, that bond that, that you, you know, you're looking at par, but by the time you, the interest rates go up, it's way, the, the price of the bond is way down. That puts a lot of pressure on these financial institutions, particularly those that weren't sophisticated and don't really understand hedging. So again, that can spread throughout the world. It's very unlikely that's over within a week. So now we're sitting there and people doesn't don't know right now the big discussion, well, is the Fed, you know, gonna stop because they've broken the system? Oh, we don't think there's gonna be a, uh, you know, any rate increase this time. Or the other argument, well, last week's inflation numbers weren't that positive. Um, it puts the Fed in a very difficult place. Um, are they going to raise um, rates? What happens? If they don't raise the rates, will the market say, oh my golly, they gave up? And there may be a short term, you know, move in the market, but the longer term money may say, wait a minute, um, they gave up. This is not good on the longer basis. I don't know. And I don't, I have no idea what the answer is, but I'm just giving you, a, trying to give you a feel for all the thoughts that are going on out there in the market. And what I'm saying is, don't guess. A lot of you have, one of the big things that hurts us as traders are biases. Some of you are gonna have biases, boy, this market, this market is really weak. Some of you are gonna have biases, boy, this, this is the bottom of the market, the market's going up. And I remember last week, I saw one report that talked about, 
and a, you know, a well-known analyst. Boy, this was the low. The market was the low was in. Somebody else that I respect, the market was going to make new lows. Today, there's a lot of stuff in the news or over the weekend that, uh, you know, oh, who was it? I guess one of the last ones I read was the uh, Wilson from Morgan Stanley. They're just entering the, uh, the the next phase of the bear market. Who knows? Going in there. So now. So as a short term trader, don't have a bias going in. Now, we've added something else to the equation. There's news that uh, um, Trump may be arrested and, you know, he's calling for protest. Who knows what effect that might? I have no idea, but it can, you know, at least on a short term basis, it can disrupt the market. So, again, we came on and talked about, you know, what's in the week ahead. I certainly don't know. But I, I do know this, that I am, if I'm doing any trade, if I do any trades at all, they'll be very short term trades. I would prefer to sit there and say, we do very little on Monday and Tuesday, if anything at all. I want to see what the market looks like after the Fed decision and, and the chairman's conference on Wednesday afternoon. I don't want I don't want to have an opinion up or down. I want what we do is that the kind of stuff that kills me. What we do is instead of listening to the talking heads, we look to see what does the market do? What do the people with real money and real orders, what do they do? Are they buying or selling? So again, coming into next week, I am totally neutral on the market. I will be very hesitant until I'll be ready to act after the uh, chairman speaks in the press conference on Wednesday afternoon after the FOMC meeting. I may not do anything, but at that point in time, we start to see the decision and out. We start to see what real people with real money are doing. Um, so again, I have a lot of, I have no real bias going into the week. And remember, biases can kill us. All right, let me stop at this point. Um, let's start, take some questions, please. Okay, somebody's asking, does Jim look at the CME Fed Watch tool for interest probability increase? Absolutely, positively not. Um, <clears throat> I wanna see what real people with real money do, okay? Okay. Does Jim ever hedge his ES positions with the SPY instead of options? I didn't used to, but I've started in the last two months. I have started trading the SPY. And uh, I don't do, I don't do much short term trading anymore. Um, I do most of what I do are just hedges in my investment account. But I build those hedges. I'm equally using um, the the spy and the uh, and the futures. Uh, matter of fact, I am actually developing uh, uh, a like a like for the spy. The volume that the spy trades is just absolutely huge. Um, I have been very, very uh, pleased with the execution. Uh, I'm doing almost all market orders on both the options on the SPY and the SPY itself. I am very, very pleased with the executions in there. So I'm doing both, but I'm leaning more and more towards the SPY. But, I, but the other thing is from time to time, um, I may use SSO, um, which is double long the S&P or SDS, which is double short the S, um, the SP. I may also use those as uh, as hedges in there, depending on you know what I'm really trying to uh, trying to to do in the in the marketplace and how easy it is. And the, sometimes, because I have been known to make adjustments during the night, um, and I find that uh, um, some things work better than others. So I. My, my, I just leave the answer that I have become, I become very interested in the spy and the depth and the executions. Okay, what else? 
Okay. Um, Somebody is asking, how does market profile enable one to trade better? <clears throat> the understand, we are not market profile traders. Market profile is nothing more than a distribution. It's a distribution graph. Scientists for years have used this method to organize information. Once they organize the information is organized, it is easier to tease important information from that uh, information. In order to form a market profile, you need two pieces of information. You need a constant, which is time on the horizontal axis and price the variable on the vertical axis. What that does is create the market profile or create the distribution curve. All that does is organize the data. It doesn't tell you to buy or sell. But if I have organized data, it's easier for me to understand what information that data is releasing. The easy example I use, let's say that I have 50 people in my backyard for a barbecue. And you come out and you say, Jim, what do you think the average height of the people in your at your barbecue is? I said, hell, I don't know. I go and I under I organize those people under a distribution curve, which is you know another way to say market profile. And I organize. I say, oh well, look, it's probably about five eight. Well, two hours later, somebody says, well, I mean, I've noticed some people coming and going. Uh, what do you think it is now? I, I organize it again and I look and I go. Now it's probably about five, six. So again, by organizing the data under a distribution curve, it just allows me to better understand the information that's there. Also, that a distribution curve is also an informational graphic. For example, the shape of the profile, simple example, if it looks like the letter P, a long stem and then a loop on the top, that's an indication of more than likely short covering. Short covering means old business, not new business. So, you know, you get a price that goes up big time and you got a P formation, the odds of much continuation are greatly lowered. You get a, a market that goes up and the profile's not too elongated, but it's, you know, it, it's more orderly. Maybe now you had a better combination of short covering and new business. <clears throat> Or that organizational graphic tells me a lot about, about the market and who I'm competing against and what is going on in the market. It helps me understand a lot about, there's other ways to do it. Markets get too long or too short. And so, I mean, what's been going on here for months when the longer term hasn't been involved in the market, we've, get it, we've gotten these constant long liquidation breaks, short covering rally. Thursday, we had a, we had a, uh, short covering rally, you know, with some other enthusiasm in them. Then we had a liquidation break on uh, on Friday. <clears throat> now you got a, something a little different on the NASDAQ because on the NASDAQ, you know, a couple of the tech stocks, you know, caught hold and had a four or five day run because people were afraid to miss it. Uh, you know, so uh, different markets made up differently. You have to look at it differently, but that's how we use, we're not profile traders. We use a distribution curve in order to organize the data. Once the data is organized, it's easier to select from that the data that is more relevant. Other questions, please. Yes, so we have uh, two different questions related to volume. Um, here's one of them. Uh, in the last week, the daily volume seems like it seems like volume has increased on average in relation to volume over the last a year's daily average. Is this the retail volume that has increased? I think so. I, I think there's just it's a strange phenomenon. You had an awful lot of new money traders that came in uh, when the pandemic started and, you know, and there were these. Uh, these programs that put money in people's pockets and a lot of new traders came in. They had a, you know, they had a few hot months in there. Most of those traders 
were inexperienced. What happened to them is the same thing that happens to all inexperienced traders. You know, they got blown up. They finally, you know, they, they finally walked away from the market. The next thing that took place was everybody got excited about zero um, days to expiration options. And now you've got expirations on every on every day. Well, it's a cheap way to speculate on the market. It doesn't mean just because they're cheap to buy and sell doesn't mean you're making money at them, but it gets a lot of people excited. And I think that you got, I got people all the talk about all oh, the gamma this and gamma that. And I doubt seriously if most people truly know what gamma is. They throw the term around. But, you know, these zero days to expiration options, I think, have added an awful lot of um, volume and short term trading to the market. I don't think the market's gone any place differently but you know this is just a it's a probably a passing fad i've seen these remember i've been trading for 50 years i've seen these fads come and go over the years and right now it's at a peak and everybody's reading about it and everybody thinks they're an ex expert on gamma and zero dated options um but look at what the market is doing overall okay what else Okay, so the other question on volume. The volume levels over the past several days have been higher than any time since early last year. Does Jim not believe that some of this may be longer term, bigger players? No, I do not. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody's got this fascination. The market makes a big move. Oh, was that big money? Where'd the big money come in? Show me a profile where big money came in. Show me a profile where big money went up. I don't think so. I think you've just got an awful lot uh, everybody wants to believe the, the big money's in the market. I started off the thing and saying, you know, one of our clients, um, it runs one of the largest institutional desks uh, that there is, for one of the major major banks. And he continually says, Jim, you're right. They're not, they're not in there. They're on the sidelines. And that doesn't mean nothing. But I'm talking about they're not dominating. But everybody wants to see that. That's the dream. Oh, I want to be with big money. Oh, how do I know when they're buying or selling? And when you get that mindset, I think it's going to be a problem. I don't see it in the market. I mean, the markets, look at this, the market's gone nowhere. All this volume you're talking about. And here's the last, I don't know how many days this covers. We've gone nowhere. So, you know, if the big money's in there, there are equal buyers and sellers in there. I think it's a lot of short-term traders, um, you know, Trying to trying to eke out a living, and the majority of people, I, I think it's still majority of people are getting it handed to them. Not only when you start trading some of this stuff, not only do you pay commissions, and it goes, "Oh, I don't pay commissions." Yeah, you do. You just don't see them, and you lose the spread between the bid and the offer. People, say, oh no, but I put my order on the bid. Well, if you get filled on the bid, by the time you you get filled on the bid, it's reverted to the offer, and so there's an awful lot of chop, awful lot of churn, awful lot of commissions. But the people that I'm looking at and they're familiar with, there aren't many people making money. Okay, what else? Okay, uh, on the surface, Thursday's rally appeared very strong and trended up all day long. What market generated information or nuances did you see to make you say that it was one of the worst that you've seen? The, you get it, it started out as a, as a trend. Well, it started out, the references were weak, to begin with. So the market was very hesitant early on. And then it started to pick up. It started to pick up steam slowly. Then we had a news announcement. <coughs> and the news announcement, the news announcement started to bring in the enthusiasm and the short cover. So the confidence was low early on. If a high confidence market will open and start to rally from the beginning. The market opened, traded lower and had some very weak references on the low. And then it's just started to get a little short covering. And then you got some news announcement. And that really tried to trigger the short cover. On a day when the market really has some strength to it, um, it will one time frame higher for a good portion of the day. The market stopped one time framing in about the fourth period. That is usually an indication that the market's not, one time framing just means that if the market's going up, that the B period bar did not take out the A period low. The C period low did not take out the B period low, et cetera. The cessation of one time framing happened early. 
and it happened twice. A couple of the givebacks on that day were very large, much more than you would expect on a strong on a strong day. Um, so it just overall, and it was just there was no real no real rhythm to the market. It was just an awful lot of short. Remember when people you get two things that happen: you get the short covering, panic, oh my God, get me out, and then you get FOMO, fear of missing out. All those people, oh boy, we've solved the banking cross process the market's going higher and in FOMO I'm sure short covering and FOMO were really at play but the structure everything else looked absolutely terrible uh, I did something I don't normally do um, I went home uh, I went home long uh, a pretty good handful of, of puts that night which normally I don't do that very often because it's just not worth it to me um, on a short-term trading basis even though it's just adjustments to my investment account. Um, on a short-term basis, you're usually better off to have a fresh start in the morning. But I couldn't resist it. I could buy some really you know, cheap out of the money um, just because I thought the market looked so terrible and it got lucky. Okay, what else? Okay. Uh, what category does Jim put many prop trading firms in? Very, the majority of them are very short-term. Most of them are very, very short term. Um, and again, I mean, there's, there's prop firms and there's prop firms. Uh, you know, you have to look at each one and, and let it have stand alone. I'm not sure that you can, I'm not sure that you can put them in a category. We have one client that's attended every, I think every program we've ever done, um, who's in a prop firm in Chicago um, and may do, may do spreads that last for, considerable period of time. We have other people that are in prop firms that are, are purely day traders. Um, so I don't think you can I don't think you can categorize them. The one thing you want to make make sure you pay attention to a lot of these these firms, you know, they they come to you and they, you know, if you do well, they're going to let you be a prop trader for them. Um, take a look and say what's really be, how do they really make their money? Do they make it by selling educational courses? Or do they make it by your being a trader? I just always ask, like anything, ask what's our motivation? What's their motivation? Understand, get yourself away from the surface and understand what the people you're dealing with, what's their real motivation? Okay, what else we got? Okay, regarding big money, if they're on the sidelines, what are you looking for or when are you expecting them to re-enter? Fed-related, technical levels, or time? I have no idea. It'll be there. It, you know, markets, uh, you know, it, it's when you start playing that game, you're probably setting yourself up for a big problem. It'll it'll happen when it happens, you know, and nobody knows those circumstances. Nobody knows those circumstances. And what happens a lot of times is it starts, it usually it usually starts with a short covering. Let's say the market's been going down. It usually starts with some kind of short covering rally. The short covering rally brings in some momentum buyers, and then you don't get the normal give back. And all of a sudden, the bigger time frame money starts to panic a little bit. Right now, the larger funds are underinvested. Now, historically, what happens, um, they're right for a long period of time. They get complacent with being right. And all of a sudden, the market starts to move higher. As it starts to move higher, they start to feel a little bit more uncomfortable because they're underinvested. And they're underinvested right now, and it's paying off just great. But every market I've ever seen, they overstay being underinvested. And they're patting themselves on the back, and all of a sudden the market kind of creeps up, and all of a sudden they feel the pain. And remember this, and in, in, in order to understand what I'm talking about, you have to understand how the longer term money, the buy and hold, the big money, how they are evaluated. They are usually evaluated against a peer group. So if you know that this kind of manager, let's say they're in, let's say their goal is to track the S&P. So they're put in with a group of managers uh, whose goal is to track the S&P. Um, if they are 
underinvested and the market goes down, they do really well. They are not, and this is most people don't understand this, they are not judged on actual performance. You and I have a tendency to think, well, did you make or lose money? The larger term, the larger pools of capital are judged on a relative basis. So the pension funds and the endowments, you know, have big pools of money with them. And they're measured against a peer group. So if the market they're measured against is down, say, 4%, and they're only down 3.8%, they've done well. If the market they're measured against up 4% and they're up 4.1%, they've done well. So it's not actual, it's on a relative basis to the peer group that they're in. But if the market starts up and they're underinvested, they are in the same place you and I are as we're short. Now they're not short, but by their being underinvested is the same. If the market goes up, their performance suffers as if they were short. So all of a sudden, if the market gets away from on the upside, they start to panic and they start to commit funds and that kind of rolls the market higher in there. But, but again, right now, it's work for them. Not too long ago when the market was, you know, was t uh, looking pretty strong here a few weeks ago <clears throat> and you had a lot of people saying, oh, the, the, the low is in, the low is in. They were sweating it tremendously. They were on the verge of caving. The market gave way before that was put to the test. But it will happen again. I've been trading 50 years. I've seen this over and over again. Okay, what else? Okay. Um, regarding, let me see here one second. Get this together here. Okay. Um, do you consider the the daily okay do you i'm trying to because they corrected the question do you consider the the daily week lows that occurred within this last es's balancing area and the fact that the absolute lows in this area were made overnight do you take note of that i take note of it i'm not sure exactly how to act on it um but i do i do i do notice it um but it's 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 seldom that you have a lasting rally high or pullback low that occurs in the overnight market. I've seen them last for a few weeks, but over my 50 years, I very seldom see them last for very long. Good lasting highs and lows are most often made during regular trading hours, okay? Let me say one more question and we'll say I'll recap for next week and then we'll say thank you. Okay. Uh, Friday was also an inside day for value. Any nuance for that? No, it's just a form of it's a form of short term balance. It's a form of short term balance. Uh, short term balance is no real surprise to me coming into, you know, the expectations for uh, for next week. Um, when a market is in short term balance and an inside day is a short is a form of short term balance. Uh, when that when that happens, uh, that is a sign the market is looking for more information before it makes its next directional move. And of course, we have more information coming, uh, particularly on Wednesday, with the FOMC. So it would be very consistent. The market would be quiet and come into short-term balance prior to that as it's awaiting new news. All right. So just a fast recap. Um, the big news. Um, the market's gone nowhere in the last several days. Big news is next week on the FOMC, there's split opinions. Some people say, oh, the Fed needs to stop before they break more. Other people will say, uh, if they stop here, the market will lose confidence in them. I don't have a bias one way or the other. I suggest that you don't have a bias one way or the other. What I think is important is what, what do the people with not the talking heads, not the people that do an analysis, analysis of what the Fed did. What do real people with real money do with the market? To me, that is the only thing that matters to me. And that keeps me out of the, the biases. Now, I threw in there, 
I don't know. There's there's talk about Trump being arrested on Tuesday, and he's calling for you know some protest. And who knows? If I don't know, they, it may be nothing. It may be nothing. But you know, it it could upset the markets. I don't know that. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying, markets. What I've been writing about. Markets hate uncertainty. Markets hate uncertainty more than anything else. And there's too much uncertainty right now. Uncertainty about what the Fed's doing, uncertainty about the banking business. Uh, and that's that's usually a bad environment. Anyhow, let me say thank you very much. And I hope you consider joining us in the uh, in the primer or our other educational programs. Thank you very much. Yep. And just to repeat, like you can purchase the primer on through uh, this Sunday tomorrow for $399 before there's a slight price increase um, after that. So if you have any questions at all, by all means, give us a call at the bottom of our website. I'm happy to answer questions. If I, for some reason I don't pick up, please leave a message and your phone number and I will definitely get back to you. Or you can also shoot us an email at Dalton at JimDaltonTrading.com. Thank you everybody for joining us this weekend. And this, record, uh, this webinar has been recorded and we will get it posted within a few hours up on our website, you'll be able to find it under public webinars at the top navigation of our website. Thank you so much. Have a great week.